Okay, so thank you very much, and uh, and uh, and it's a nice initiative by Swadhin about this thing, and uh, because we are living in a pandemic, and the way we are, it's a very good mechanism to show in the entire world, like most probably in India, as to how there are different things in life that one should do, not just uh, there are many view, there are many perspectives of live your life. And I'm just trying to show you one way to live your life, and uh, which is through the way of doing science or something like that. And um, this might be this talk might be about biophysics, but it's more about how to think how to think about a problem. So you should come out of this talk thinking: if I look at a new problem, how do I think about it? Okay, so it should be clear as to what I mean by these things later on. So let's begin the talk. The talk is going to be what is biophysics and a bit about science in general. So uh, just to inter interrupt you one more moment, uh, like if anyone has any questions anytime, uh, they can kind of raise the hand or like write on a chat or can uh, if there are because there are very few people now, so they can ask directly after unmuting themselves and just ask directly. Yeah, I think you should just ask me the question when you have the doubt, rather than waiting for the entire talk to finish. That's fine with me. Okay, so let's be. Uh, okay, so let's begin. Okay, so first let's talk about as to what physics is, because we are talking about biophysics. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a conjugation of two words. It's biology and physics both. Um, so Adin, can you remove me from the, uh, uh, because people are getting admitted and it shows on to me that. Uh, uh, okay, so I can demote you uh, from, let me see. Uh, okay. Can I demote you? No. I yeah, now you are the host, so now okay. I will not get it. Okay. Okay, that's fine. So now you'll not be getting the things. So you have to enable me to share the screen. Go to the share screen and. Uh, yes, yeah. Um, okay. Can you, can you share now? Oh, can you all see now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a bit about physics first because the talk that we are gonna talk about is biophysics. So it's a culmin it's a conjugation of two things, physics and bio biology. So first let's talk about physics and I'm gonna give you an overview of how physics is thought about in general. So physics in the contemporary sense began with this guy and I am pretty much sure that you all know him. So he is basically Newton, okay? So what did Newton do in 1600s? So he told you that if you have a particle of mass M and, and you exert some force on it, it gives you an acceleration, which is basically mass times acceleration is equal to force. And given the level of you all, I, I presume all of you know this because I assume that you are in standard 11 and 12. So I think you would be knowing these kind of stuff. So this is very clear to everyone that if you push a, push a mass of object M, it will produce you some acceleration. So basically the acceleration is given as a, in, a, in calculus sense, it's given as the D2X of DT2 is basically the second derivative of the position as a function of time. And generally, and that's related to the force. And generally the forces in nature is gravitational force, electrostatic force, and the nuclear force. So, Generally, when you look at a problem, you try to do this, you, at least in the classical physics sense. You basically put in the Newton's equation and solve the trajectory of the particle as a function of time. And when I was your age, like 10 years back, I knew this as well. And I was very happy that I know so much about the world. But it just took me about 10 more years. Maybe I'm a bit stupid, but it took me 10 more years to understand what it means in a more philosophical sense. It means that if you have an effect, you have to understand what's the cause of it. So the force is like a cause 
and the effect is basically the trajectory or the acceleration of the particle. So the whole goal of physics or any predictive science is to understand what is the cause and why is the effect and how is the effect related to the cause. So if you know the cause, you can understand what's the effect. So that's the goal. So this is a more general perspective of Newton's law. This is basically telling you how is effect mediated by the cause. Okay, let me give you a simple example of what do I mean by a cause and an effect. So here you have a human being which is gonna be thrown through a cannonball. So let's look at this very cool video first. So you have a human being which is going inside the cannonball And if you guys have any questions, you should just ask me. And this guy is thrown away into this kind of a trajectory and he bounces off and he does not die. Okay, so that's good. So this is a video. So what is the cause and what is the effect? So let's look at that. So the effect is the path of this human being or the position or the trajectory of the man as a function of time. And the cause is the initial velocity because of this gun, there is a force that is generated which gives him a velocity, initial velocity, and you know there is gravity there. Therefore the, trajectory of the, therefore, the trajectory of this man looks like that. So in, uh, we all know this looks like a, approximately like a projectile motion, which all of you have heard, it, heard, uh, heard in kinematics. So this is a very rudimentary or a very simple example of a cause and an effect. So when you're looking at this cause and effect, you didn't talk about like when you are in standard 11th and 12th, you're solving maths problems in physics all the time. No one tells you what you're actually doing. You're basically trying to mimic an effect through a cause. You write down the Newton's law, you have the force and you write down the equations and then you solve the position as a function of time, which comes out to be like a parabola or something like that. So this is approximately like a projectile motion. So why do we use mathematics? How does mathematics come in all of this? So mathematics helps to objectively define the cause and the effect. It removes all kind of ambiguity in the problem. So in the case of the projectile, the effect is your position as a function of time, the 3D coordinates as a function of time and the cause is your initial velocity and the gravitational force. And then you write down the equation that the m d2 x dt2 is equal to mg with subject to the initial conditions that the initial velocity is v, v initial. So when you do this, what you are actually doing that this you are representing in a, this problem in a universal sense. This is a universal representation of the problem. In simple terms, everyone in the whole world can understand the problem equally. It does not depend on the language that you are speaking. It does not depend whether you're talking Hindi, Urdu or English or whatever. When you write down this in an equation form, this equation gives you a unique representation of this problem. And everyone in this whole world can understand this problem equally well. Whether you can solve it, that's another part of the problem. So, so do you understand if any one of you have any questions, you should, under, you should ask me. This seems a bit of trivial, but it's a very, um, it might be very philosophical in some sense and, if, and it might be a bit abstract. So if you have any questions, you should ask me right now. I'll wait for like 10 seconds. Okay, but this was just a projectile motion and everyone knows about it. And the goal of contemporary physics is to solve something more complicated, which is very non-trivial. So some of the very complicated known cause and effect are shown here. The effect is basically the standard model of elementary particles. So when you look at the universe in very small scales, you have many types of particles like electrons, protons, 
nucleon, uh, neutrons and all those kind of things, gluons, they are made up of some smaller subatomic particles. So those, that's an effect, and that has been measured through lots of experiments, like the Large Hadron Collider and all those kind of experiments. So when you have an effect, you need a mathematical representation of the problem to solve that problem objectively. And this on the right-hand side is basically your gravitational wave discovery and where these graphs, the graphs have just uh, shown you the, the signal that was received by the merger of two black holes. So when you have this effect, you want to understand it. And the way you understand is through equations. And the equations, because it helps when, and you write it in terms of equations is because you want to understand it objectively, okay? So this, in, for the case of standard model, this is the way you understand it. This is the, if anyone knows what these equations represent, it would be very nice, but I'll still go ahead. So, so on the left-hand side, you have the standard model Lagrangian for the elementary particles. This is basically the standard model. And on the right-hand side, you have the Einstein field equations, which, which tells you how, um, how were these black holes merged and what was the gravitational wave that was produced due to the merger of these black holes. So this uh, can is the way you understand the context, the, Can you give a bit of context on the like standard model and uh, just, I, I don't know, like people know so, this. So standard model is basically uh, the foreground of particle physics. So everyone knows in this, uh, in uh, everyone knows that there are atoms and then you go on to make uh, protons and nuclear, uh, nu uh, neutrons and then protons are made up of up, down and all those quarks and then you have electrons. So how do these come by? You need to understand it from a unifying perspective. Con uh, uh, perspective in the sense you have to uh, merge all the laws of physics in a more concrete sense. And these particles have to, be, have to, be, have to emerge from those laws by, the, by themselves. So you need a framework. And that framework is basically given here. This is the standard model Lagrange. I'm not talking the details of its very difficult mathematics but the standard model is uh, given by these Lagrangian, which is basically trying to tell you the forces. So basically you write down the Newton's law, it's like the force. So you, you write, when you write down the Lagrangian, you can get the force out of those Lagrangians and then you can solve those. And similarly here, you have the Einstein field equation. So basically it was developed in 1915 in terms of general relativity to solve the Einstein field equations, which gives you these signals, which look like the wave shown here. So this was a bit a primer on physics, okay? So this is how we do physics. Basically, you want to understand the cause and the effect, okay? So now you ask me the question, what is biophysics, okay? The whole talk was as to what biophysics is. So, when, so what biophysics mean, the effect is of biological origin, okay? And the goal is to figure out the cause. So this is the simple definition of biophysics. Like when the effect is of biological origin, you want to understand what is the cause. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you some of the important problems. I'm not going to tell you much more uh, in, into the mathematics or anything. I just want you to leave you all, all, all of you guys to think about how to think about these problems. And if anyone is interested in these kind of things, you should study and try to think about these problems and be observant of the nature that you see around yourself. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you some of the great minds. Initially, I'm gonna tell you about some of the great minds who thought about these problems. So on the left, you have a Sir Darcy Somson in which in 1924, write down a book, wrote down a book on growth and form. So on growth, so basically, Everything that you see, every living object that you see in this world is a consequence of repeated uh, evolution as a function of time. And there is huge amount of symmetry that he saw in his books. And one of the book is on growth and form. It's a marvelous piece of work. And I recommend all of you to read this book if you want. So what you have is that the living world has a mathematical symmetry in nature in general. So if you look at this shale, this is like a shale. And if you take the cross section of it, it looks like a logarithmic spiral. 
So there's a mathematical symmetry. There is a mathematical property of these living objects. And he showed in his book that, that making some mathematical transformations, you can go from one thing to the other. So you should read his book to understand, but I'm just telling you that there are people who have thought about these issues before, and I'm just giving you an overview. So, and then everyone knows about quantum mechanics and he know, and, and quantum mechanics seems very different from biology, okay? But here is your guy, Erwin Schrodinger, who, won, who devised the Schrodinger equation. And he wrote down a book, which is probably one of the most important inspiration bo inspirational books to understand biophysics, which is basically what is life. So he tells in his books that every, so your cell is made up of chemicals and chemicals are basically made up of molecules and molecules are made up of atoms and atoms have, you, have, you, as, have concise representation in physics. So how can we understand through physics this meaning of life? And it's a very hard problem to think of it. And it was then further elaborated in this remarkable piece of work, which is basically called, called as more is different. And this is a great condensed matter physicist whose name is Phil Anderson. So Phil Anderson basically told you that as you put in more and more and more individual particles in a collective system, you, you observe the property, which is very different from uh, the individual components of that system. So this was just, you don't have to worry about what these people have done. I, but I just wanted to tell you, there have been people who have thought about the intricacies of life through the lens of physics. And it is a very challenging task to do. And uh, I am now going to tell you about some of the problems which are important. And it's going on in your body at all times, but you do not think of it. So the first problem is of protein folding. So what is a protein, okay? So proteins are chains of amino acids which carry out cell functions once folded into a proper structure. So basically the, you have in your cell, a cell is basically the whole the, the, the unit of your whole body. Like cell is, a, is how your whole body is, compromised, is comprised of. So in your cells, you have your proteins and these proteins have to assemble in a three, three dimensional structure. Only when they have assembled in the three dimensional structure, can you understand, can, can they carry out the functions to carry out your daily lives? So you, it's a very important problem to understand that. So in this video, what you see is that you have this, this is a three dimensional structure and then this is the unfolded structure of the protein. And then you solve your, new, the, solve your Newton's law. And then somehow as a function of time, because of the forces in these molecules, they start to fold. And there have been a lot of studies about protein folding where you begin with an initial conformation and you have to go to a final conformation. And then you have the problem of transport of cargos inside the cells. So what you have is you have a motor protein, okay? This is wa walking on a vesicle, on a, on a track, and it's carrying a cargo. It's a big cargo, and it walks like this. It's in your, inside your cell. It's quite amazing that you have these kind of objects which are of the order of nanometers, which you cannot even see, and they are carrying out your daily lives and I'll play this video again. It's very beautiful. So you have a cargo on the top of this uh, motor. So this is called a motor in general, and it takes those cargos and move from one part of the cell to the other parts of the cell. So this, uh, this, these, uh, this is one more problem in biology, which people are trying to understand as to how this complicated phenomena takes place inside the, inside the body. And then, so, and then you have uh, the problem of your white blood cells. How do they uh, treat when you get a when you get get a bacteria inside the body? How do they kill those bacteria cells? So these white blood cells are called, called as macrophages because they are protector of your body, and they kill those bacteria by following them. 
So it's a very cool video to understand. So this is a bacteria here and the cell is trying to catch it. And it's quite remarkable because you cannot able to decipher what is the force here because it's very hard. So to, to, to make the, to understand, you, you can see the effect very close, very easily that the cell is trying to kill this bacteria, but it's very hard to figure out the cause. No one is pushing anyone, it's trying to just follow it. So how it's doing it? It's very hard to do, solve these kind of problems. And then you have a very beautiful uh, picture of a National Geographic video of the swarming of birds. Uh, so these Sumit, birds, uh, yeah. uh, just to interrupt, there is a question on the chat uh, from Sanjeev. Uh, you, can, you, can uh, ask it, you can ask directly to me. It's okay. Yeah. Sanjeev, uh, if you're there, you can unmute and directly ask. And if you're, uh, yeah. Sanjeev? If you're shy, then I can just. Okay, so the question is, uh, uh, there is background noises, he's saying. So the question is, uh, why can't amino acid chains be functional uh, when they are not folded in 3D structure? Okay, so you're talking about the protein folding thing. Uh, okay. yeah, yes, yeah. they so, are asking. The so, so amino acids, it's a very good question. And one cannot say, why does it need to fold? Because, so the exact question is, why does the amino acid, what did he say? What he's saying, uh, uh, why is it fold? That's the first one. And also another point is that why asking why they are not if they are not folded in this specific structure, why are not that functional? Like uh, why they need to be folded into this structure to be functional? Uh, why can't amino acid be functional without this kind of specific 3D structures? Okay, so, so think about like this. Any, uh, when you want to carry out a task, so the goal of the protein is to, 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 to basically carry out the cell's function, okay? And you can only do the function if you are oriented or you're, you are, you are, you are oriented in a particular manner. You cannot do anything, like imagine something in your life. You can only solve a problem if you are in a proper state of mind, okay? You cannot solve any problem, like if you are confused or anything like that. So similarly, think of, of, a, poly, of a protein as well. If, it's, if, if the orientation of the protein is very, not uh, proper, it cannot carry out that job properly well, but it's very hard to pinpoint until unless you, you ask me a specific question as to why is this protein like this? Because the protein has to bind some receptor or something like that. And if it is not folded in that structure, the receptor cannot come and talk to that. So, so the protein, the structure of the protein is just one part of the problem. There are other things as well. So when the protein carries out a function, it has to talk to some other molecules as well. And the, and the conversation between that molecule to that protein has to only happen if that structure is in that shape. So that has to go through that folding mechanism before that protein can talk to that molecule. And then it can carry out the effect, uh, then, carry, then, it, then only can it carry out the job that has been prescribed to do. I hope it's a very rudimentary way of answering things, but I'm trying to give you a more uh, understandable uh, question, uh, the way of thinking about this. I think, are there more questions here? No, you can continue, but no, continue. Yeah, so this was the problem of your macrophage and now you have a beautiful uh, problem of, which looks in your skies, okay? So where you have birds which are moving in like random direction, but they make these beautiful patterns and uh, you have to understand the simple laws of Newton's law as to why this is possible. And in the language of physics, it's called phase transition and it's related to how the solid or, or the liquid, like how does a solid go to a liquid phase and then how does the liquid go to a gas phase? So it's basically a physics of phase transitions. Okay, so you have to, so, so the goal is through simple laws in physics, how do you understand this? How do you understand this phenomenon? So you can see at the beautiful patterns that these individual birds are making in, the, in your sky. And so you have to understand it. And it's a pretty challenging problem if you want to 
understand these kind of issues. You see this pattern and uh, I don't understand how can nature do these kind of things because no one is controlling these birds, okay? So you have to understand through simple laws as to how this is happening. So I have given you, if you look at the scales of the problem, uh, so this protein folding is occurs on a scale of nanometers, okay? It's of, of the order of, because hydrogen atom is of the order of 10 angstrom, of, of the order of angstroms. And then this you go to, so basically I arrange these videos as the way the scale of the problem changes as a fun, as when you look at it. And all of these are biological problems. So this protein folding is of the order of nanometers. And then this is order of tens of nanometers, the transport of cargo inside the cells. This problem is of the order of microns because the cell is of the order of microns. And this forming of birds is of the order of like meters. Understand? So there is a scale problem. Like when you go from micron scale, uh, like go from the nanometer scale to meter scale and how the physics changes because this motion is very different from this motion. So basically when you change the scale of the problem, the, the emergent property of the physics changes as well. And you want to understand these kind of things. So these are just some cool videos that I wanted to show you, which people try to understand right now. These are contemporary research problems. Okay, so what do I work on? I'm going to give you like two or three slides. So there is another question. Uh, Rauno, if you can directly ask, you can directly ask. Uh, or if you have any noise, uh, then I will uh, read the question. Raunak, Raunak Kumar Das. Uh, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, my question is that uh, 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 when bacteria enters the cell, uh, the macrophage moves and uh, finds the bacteria and uh, uh, kills it. Yeah. So it is, uh, it, is the, it is the cause of moving uh, of the macrophage uh, and the effect is that the bacteria is killed. Uh, but uh, so, my so, question okay. is that why, why the birds are uh, uh, forming these structures, uh, these impressive structures? So regarding your, you gave me a simple explanation as to what is the cause and what is the effect for the macrophage. But I want to ask you a simple question as well like a, a bacteria cannot see the back because there is no visual mechanism, okay? For the bacteria, uh, for the cell to look at the bacteria. So how is the back, how is the cell knowing that the bacteria is there? It does not have a sensor attached to it, okay? Bacteria and the cell, back, the bacteria and the cell are independent objects. So what is going on as to how it is sensing, the sensing mechanism is unknown, okay? So it's a more, more problematic sense. And also the other question that you asked about the swarming of birds, it's also a very hard problem. So what happens is that you have these different birds. So you have these different birds. So what happens is that a, 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 a bird has the visual mechanism to look at the other bird, okay? And somehow, because of that visual mechanism, the bird is trying to align its velocity towards that bird, the next nearest neighbors. And when that coupling between the nearest neighbors happen, there is a huge cooperative phenomena that goes on. And therefore it, you find these structures in, in, in your object. Therefore you understand, like if I imagine you have 10 human beings, okay? And if every human being is trying to replicate as to what the other human is doing, then you will get a, pattern like this, like everyone goes in the same direction, or there is some kind of a pattern which is going to form, understand? Uh, okay, so now understand. Okay, just to also I kind of probe a philosophical point, what might be he might be meaning. So he's saying that uh, there might be some phenomena where the uh, cause is very clear, correct? Or the yeah. effect is very clear, or there might be some phenomena where uh, you don't have any clear apparent reason. Like if you think of from a human perspective, suppose you are studying, you get want to get marks, correct? Or sometimes just you kind of uh, doing nothing of repurposing. So, so the question might be like put in a different way. Is there uh, all phenomena needs to have this kind of purpose uh, to, to kind of act? Uh, no, so 
any objective phenomena, like anything that you want to do, has to have a, so generally, as far as I understand, and I might be wrong, the effect is pretty easy to see. Generally, the effect is can be looked as through a microscope, in, at least in terms of science. You can, use an, you can use telescopes, you can use microscopes, you can use cameras to look at the effect. Like the effect generally is like the motion of something as a function of time. So motion of something as a function of time is easy to trace out because of the, because of the uh, experiments that you do. But the cause is very hard to figure out because there, may, there can be many causes that lead to the same effect. It's not a one-to-one -one problem. It's a many-to-one problem. So it's very hard to figure out the cause, but you want to understand the cause within the realms of the present knowledge. And that's how you constrain your possibilities in life. Like imagine you want to get some score in your exam. That's your effect that you want to see. The mechanism are, there are very different ways to get high, high scores in your exam. One is to cheat, one is to work hard. And there might be some other ways as well, but cheating can lead you to trouble. So that is not an acceptable way to solve that problem. So generally the other problem, other way to do it is to study hard. That is an acceptable way. So there might be many ways to solve a problem, but there are only few ways to, there are a few acceptable ways to solve, a, to solve a problem which everyone is gonna agree to. And generally you want, in science, you wanna solve the problem in a manner where there is, can be a scientific consensus. Okay, sure, we can move on, yeah. So, I will give you, uh, so this is not important what I work on, but I will tell you what I work on. And, and I, basically it's about the physics of tissues and it might be important in the, concept, in, in, the, in the context of cancer, it can be important in the context of uh, other problems as well. So I'll tell you something about, you look at this beautiful picture where you have a, you have a cell in green and these are very hard experiments to do. You have your cell, which is moving in a collagen matrix. So the collagen is basically a, some kind of a structure, like you provide structure to your house. That's how your body is supported through these collagen matrices. That's a support, the support of your body is these collagen matrices. And these cells have to move inside these uh, collagen objects. So you look at these, uh, images and it tells you it's a very complicated like the cell is protruding like this and you don't even know how it's moving so the how is the interaction between these matrices and the cell is coupled and then produces these kind of motion you want to understand that because it you want to understand it because it will be important in solving bigger problems which is in the context of cancer or wound healing or some other and then you have another beautiful experiment here so these are very difficult experiments to do and it's a very hard problem so you have the, so have you ever imagined like when you were kids, like when you are small, like you are of the size of like an egg and then you become human beings, which are of the size of like, of like, uh, uh, of meters. During this evolution of your body, your when you are in the mother's womb, you have to, your head, so that egg that is formed because the fusion of the egg uh, from the sperm and the other thing, your head has to go to a particular location. Your leg has to go to a particular location. Your hand has to go to a particular location. So there is a pattern formation inside your body. So how does that happen? Who tells you that, oh, this cell has to go to the head. That cell has to go to the leg. How do we know that? So this is a cool video where this is a fruit fly, which is like a model system where you can study without killing a human being. You can kill insects. So. This is the way it happens inside the body of a fruit fly. So you see these segregations being formed in the, I'll run this video more. And then, so you look at the time scale here, just this is an, of the order of like three hours or so. And then there are patterns that are being formed here. You see, there are divisions, axes that are formed. And then you see there's a head, there's a different parts of the body and then this happens and now the goal is to understand it now imagine how hard is this problem to understand so i'm just telling you some problems which when you 
when you guys, if ever want to become a scientist, can think of, at least in this context, if you want to. And then you have your cancer as well. And cancer, everyone knows, it's a very hard problem to solve. Why it's a hard problem? There are long, long stories, and I can go on for hours. But I'm just telling you that the physics of that problem is very hard to understand. Because the cell is growing as a function of time, and it's, an, it's a complicated system. Everyone is interacting with everyone else and to understand. And in my research, I try to understand it. And I wanted to show you a movie like this, where you have a cell which is growing as a function of time and you want to understand how does every cell in this object move. Imagine you have so many particles and everyone is moving differently. How are you going to understand it? Just think of it. So I'm just giving you a flavor of as to how things are, how do people do research? You have your experiment and you want to understand it through a model or something like that. So that if you understand the model, you can tune the experiment. So they are coupled in some sense. So I, I have a one question like uh, these models, how do you know these models are correct? You don't know your models are correct. So when you, so basically you, you begin with your Newton's law. So everyone, every, I showed you the Newton's law, okay? So you have to begin from there and you have to model the interactions because everything moves because of the force. You have to somehow come up with a force picture which re recapitulates the experiment that is present till today. And when you have done that, you have some amount of confidence in that model. No model is perfect, but some models are useful. And then when you have that model, you try to extrapolate the consequences of that model. And then you go to the lab again, measure the, measure the ex, some, do some experiments and test the predictions of that model. And if that prediction matches with the model, then you are like, okay, there is some trust that can be bestowed on this model. So that's how it works. Okay, so there was enough of uh, science that we talked about. I just wanted to tell you guys, I, want, I wanted to tell you something which I think you should take it. When you go home and sleep at night, you should think about these things. And there's no other human being on the planet apart from Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman was, was one of the most uh, soundest, cleverest minds ever. And you should listen to him if you ever get in doubt. So I'm just going to play a video by him. And uh, just hold up a flower. And say... I have a friend who's an artist and is sometimes taken a view which I don't agree with very well. You hold up a flower and say, look how beautiful it is. And I'll agree, I think. And he says, you see, as I as an artist can see how beautiful this is, but you as a scientist, oh, take this all apart and it becomes a dull thing. And I think that he's kind of nutty. First of all, the beauty that he sees is available to other people and to me too, I believe, although I may not be quite as refined as aesthetically as he is, but I can appreciate the beauty of the flower. At the same time, I see much more about the flower than he sees. I could imagine the cells in there, the complicated actions inside, which also have a beauty. I mean, it's not just beauty at this dimension of one centimeter. There's also beauty at a smaller dimensions, the inner structure, also the processes, the fact that the colors and the flower are evolved in order to attract insects to pollinate it is interesting. It means that insects can see the color. It adds a question. Does this aesthetic sense also exist in the lower forms that are, does it, why is it aesthetic? All kinds of interesting questions, which the science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery and the awe of a flower. It only adds, I don't understand how it subtracts. If you expected science to give all the answers to the wonderful questions about what we are, where we are, what the meaning of the universe is and so on, then I think you could easily become the solution and then look for some mystic answer to these problems. How a scientist can take a mystic answer, I don't know, because the whole spirit is to understand. Well, never mind that. Any, I don't understand that. But anyhow, uh, 
if you think of it though, I, the way I think of what we're doing is we're exploring, we're trying to find out as much as we can about the world. People say to me, are you looking for the ultimate uh, laws of physics? No, I'm not. I'm just looking to find out more about the world. And if it turns out there is a simple ultimate law that explains everything, so be it. That would be very nice to discover. If it turns out it's like an onion with millions of layers and we're just sick and tired of looking at the layers, then that's the way it is. But whatever way it comes out, its nature is there and she's going to come out the way she is. And therefore, when we go to investigate it, we shouldn't pre-decide what it is we're trying to do except to find out more about it. You see, one thing is I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. I have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of certainty about different things, but I'm not absolutely sure of anything. And there are many things I don't know anything about, but I don't have to know an answer. I don't have, I don't feel frightened by not knowing things, by being lost in the mysterious universe without having any purpose, which is the way it really is, as far as I can tell possible. It doesn't frighten me. And so altogether, I can't believe the special stories that have been made up about our relationship to the universe at large, because they seem to be too simple, too, too, too connected, too local, too provincial. The earth, he came to the earth. One of the aspects of God came to the earth, mind you. And look at what's out there. How can he, it isn't in proportion. Anyway, it's no use arguing. I can't argue it. I'm just trying to tell you. With the scientific view, or well, my father's view, that we should look to see what's true and what may, be, may not be true. Once you start doubting, which I think is, to me is a very fundamental part of my soul, is to doubt and to ask. When you doubt and ask, it gets a little harder to believe. So he is a big uh, inspiration to me and the way he speaks about science i think everyone regardless of whatever you do in your life should listen to him and if you want to solve any problem okay so the goal of your life you might be think you you might think that the goal of your life can be to earn the goal of your life in the simple sense like your our parents tell us is to earn a living, get married, produce kids, and do whatever you want. But, but if you look on a more deeper sense, the goal, there's no goal to life. And you want to understand what's near you. And the way to do it is the only way to do it, science or maths or engineering or whatever, or through poetry or something like that. And, and there's a bit of advice that I would like to give it to you because you are young students which are like in high school or something like that. And it's very important because when I was your age, I was just solving mathematics. I didn't understand as to why I'm doing what I am doing. Once you know what you are doing and why you are doing, you can understand the meaning of it. And when you understand the meaning, the process becomes enjoyable. No one wants to solve such big equations without knowing what's the purpose of it. Don't look for the mathematical, if you want to solve a problem, don't look as to how complicated the mathematics is. It's just to understand, just to appreciate the problem. And every problem is very hard to solve. And this does not apply, and this video does not just apply to becoming a scientist. It requires everyone. You want to become a doctor, you want to become a farmer, you want to do MBA or whatever. You want to make lots of money, you have to do this. You ask me if an ordinary person, by studying hard, would get to be able to imagine these things like I imagine. Of course, I was an ordinary person who studied hard. There's no miracle people. It just happens they got interested in this thing and they learned all this stuff. They're just people. There's no talent, a special miracle ability to understand quantum mechanics or a miracle ability to imagine electromagnetic fields that comes without practice and reading and learning and study. So if you say, you take an ordinary person 
who was willing to devote a great deal of time and study and work and thinking and mathematics and time and I, then he's become a scientist. So I'm not going to take much of your time and I'm just going to end you with a just small uh, thing that keep on asking why around you and you will do wonders in your life. And when I say wonders, it's not about becoming famous or something like that or making lots of money. Those are secondary issues. When you understand and question why, you will try to appreciate your life as to why the things are the way they are near you. And everything is highly, highly complicated. And it's very, very okay to not know something and being confused. Do not be shy when to say, I don't know. It's okay. No one knows anything in this world, by the way. And anyone who tells you that they know a lot or is speaking a lie. So, so I don't know anything, by the way. So I'm just stopping here. And if you have any questions, if you have any philosophical questions, if you have any other things, you can just ask me. Thank you very much. So thank you, Shumit, for a interesting talk. OK. So there is a question, Shayan uh, Bishesh. Uh, you can directly ask. Shayan Bishesh. What's the uh, question? Is there any mathematical? Uh, so yeah, you just explanation on people's behavior and problems. Okay, so okay, so I want to tell you something. When you look at a problem, you can frame that problem in. You said there is a mathematical explanation. Okay, so when you look at a problem, you can talk it in English. Okay, let's say I am hungry, so that's a problem, and I need food. So, and I will use Hindi or English or whatever language to speak that. But when you want to explain something, you need to know what you want to explain. You need to have some data to explain that. And when you have a, if you want to have that data, when you have the data, you can write down a model. And when you write down the model, you have to express it in mathematics. And when you write down the mathematics of the problem, the, the, the mathematics has to recapitulate the data. And then you have to predict something. Then only it has some meaning. If it does not predict or it does not explain anything, it does not have a meaning. So if you solve mathematical problems in your school, it does not have any meaning to your life, by the way. It is, it, you might be able to crack some exams but it's not going to be of any use to anyone. So, uh, so there is another question, but Sharashwat uh, Sen Sharma, you have raised your hand. Uh, do you want to uh, ask any questions? So you can ask directly. Then if, if not, then you can go to Oily's question. So Sharashwat Sen Sharma. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I had a question actually. Yeah. Uh, so my question was, uh, and you do, uh, the, first of all, you don't need to call us sir or anything. We don't know anything. You should just call us by our name. I mean, and do not. And when you are in school, people might you you might you might address your teachers as sir or something. But that you don't need to do it in life. By the way, you should just. I wish you could just call them by their names because when you call someone a sir, it means that you they know something. And trust me, they don't know anything. So. Okay. So uh, yeah. Can, Sharashat, okay. Uh, you can kind of be asked. Thank you uh, so much. Yeah. And uh, my question is uh, that uh, uh, when the birds, uh, when we are dealing with the birds' motion, uh, yeah. how do we objectively describe the problem? Uh, okay. Can we simply say that the birds are doing what they're doing because they want to? Okay. Is it so is it free it's will? A, it's, a, it's a very very beautiful question. Okay. It's a very fantastic question. How do we do something objectively? Okay. So now I will tell you how to do it objectively. Imagine the birds are flying in your sky, okay? And you want to quantify it. So the way to do it, to objectively do something is to quantify it. When you write something in mathematical terms, it becomes quantitative and it is universal and objective. So imagine you have birds flying in nature. So you can set up a camera which can record the birds as a function of time. So you, can, you have to take a camera where the frame speed of the camera is faster than the velocity of the bird, okay? If now, if you are clicking the camera very fast, therefore you will record the trajectory of the birds. 
and when you have the trajectory of the birds you have you have the data and now you have to create a model or a physical model which explains that data and predict something so when you create a model you can understand as to why the birds are doing what they are doing understand like when you are throwing a ball in the air how do you know that your kinematical equations that you write are correct what you do is you record the trajectory of the ball as a function of time and you record how much time it took so you are doing mathematics and when you write down a the newton's law the with gravity in it you basically solve that and you show that oh my model can recapture recapture the data and somehow you can use that model to predict something else like if i throw the ball at different angles how much time it's going to take understand so that's how you do quantitative and objective science so i want to kind of just add any question so i i i know this is not my question so what eugene asked you no know, uh, that why mathematics is so good in explaining this correct mathematical so, mathematics is good because it's objective everyone can understand it the same way like if you say bengali to me i might not understand and whenever you tra translate a problem depending on what is the mode of communication you are losing information whenever you are conveying and mathematics is the best way to convey the information with minimal loss uh yes but how do you know that that's a minimal loss i mean because everyone is trained in that because if you write down a matrix of n cross n everyone knows that's a matrix of n cross n depending on the properties of that matrix you might say what it's happening but everyone understands it uniformly if when this i say is... a matrix everyone gets understanding of what a matrix is yeah so that's kind of, i mean yeah this is kind of a common language which kind of everyone understands it's like a representation of the problem so oheli uh, oheli has a question you can ask directly yeah am i audible yes uh i will like to know that uh, how neurons exactly work like the voltage gated ion channels yes by through the process the information can you shed some light on that so when you say okay so when you so basically what neurons are doing as far as i understand is basically is transmitting the signal from one synapse to the other synapse okay well, from one neuron to the other and there is a gap called synapse in between and there are some chemicals there which creates a voltage difference and it goes from one synapse to the other it's basically something like like a simple electro uh, like if you put if you have a battery and there is a potential difference the, there is a signal in the form of electrons which goes from one battery to the other so similarly in the case of neurons you have your voltage difference between one neuron to the other neuron and the way the signal is being transmitted in the form of some chemicals or ions so whenever you have a voltage difference the ions can go from one one place to the other and that's how the signal is being transmitted in your brain so that's you have to when you do uh, neuron or what when you want to understand how does neurons work so you have to quantify as to what's the time scale in the problem where one thing goes from the other from one synapse to the when one goes from one neuron to the other and it has to because of the potential difference because of the ions that is created there so uh you have to think in that terms and it's very complicated because what you are doing is that if you think of it you look at an object in your visual world and that signal that image because of the light being transmitted to your eyes is getting inside your brain and that somehow that light is being transferred trans is being transformed in a signal in terms of ions and then that ion is being transmitted to your brain in the in the signals of your brain so it's a very very complicated problem what i'm saying is very simplistic but you have to do very rigorous science to understand as to what is going on so i can only tell you these kind of stuff right now so you have to very so you from the fundamentals of physics because what i'm telling you is just electrostatics so you have to there are only four forces in nature one is gravity one is electrostatics one is strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force so you should try and these are the four simplest things in life and you have to explain everything from here if you can do that you have objectively understood the problem thank you uh i have a question okay uh so just tell you know you should home correct yeah hello yes yeah yeah you can ask you can um, ask my go 
yeah we, uh, we can hear you uh, just carry on here sir uh, first of all uh, you told us about that uh, we can measure the effect and it is quite easy but uh, we have uh, we know there is something called uh, heisenberg uncertainty principle that yes. means that we cannot measure two things together like um, velocity and uh, their particular position then in that case how do we actually measure the stuff uh, we, yeah, we cannot so, measure so, the effect okay. in... so you you cannot measure everything because it depends a lot. so the heisenberg uncertainty limit is the fundamental limit of measurement or anything but it depends on what you want to describe okay so in when you go to quantum mechanics you are not measuring the position of the of the electrons or you're not measuring the you're not measuring the velocity or something like that so you only measure those kind of things in your classical systems very macroscopic objects when you go to that regime you are measuring something else like if you have a superconducting material so generally quantum mechanics is used to understand superconductivity or something like that so in that case you are trying to measure something called the resistivity or something like that where the where the resistance of the object goes down to zero or something like that and the object becomes a superconducting material so depends on what you are measuring okay and it and you cannot do anything so and there's a there, I, I might have been wrong in saying you can measure the effect easily uh, you have to be very careful as to what you want to describe in, in when you go to that regime of quantum mechanics it's very hard to measure the uh be, be measure the the electrons the position of the electron or anything like that because the the first of all you do not have a machine to measure to do anything you need something to call to measure the effect you need a camera you need to have some kind of an instrument that measures it and there is no camera or any any instrument that has been made which can capture the dynamics at that small scales therefore you measure something which is of practical use like the uh, resistance or something like that so it depends it depends on what you are formulating and there are limits to what you can do you cannot do anything um okay then uh, suppose we cannot do that i mean we don't yeah. have that camera and we don't have that thing but that doesn't mean those things don't exist so like velocity and position but you do, do not exist, know so, so velocity is a def is a calculus definition velocity is basically the, it was invented by calculus it is not a physical thing it's a mathematical construct okay velocity is not like was given by nature velocity was given by isaac newton and leibniz by because they because they define that the velocity is the derivative of dx dt where basically x of t plus delta t minus x of t by delta t where delta t goes to zero so that's so a mathematical quantity abstract concept that's an abstract concept the nature does not care about that you are what you are doing is trying to remorph the nature in terms of what you can understand to the principles of mathematics because that's a universal language that understand means, uh, if there is something abstract i mean it doesn't necessarily mean that it should exist we can yeah. just make it out yeah you can make you can cook up anything in life you can create your own theory but it might not be useful to anyone oh Okay. so this is one kind of mapping no so that mapping is in our head so how do you that mapping either can be some approximate of the whatever the reality or that mapping may be totally wrong or that mapping just resides in our head if there is another life form they might have different mathematics different physics different understanding correct who asked you to to you calculate velocity i mean velocity is taught in school but who asked you you can create anything else yeah sure so there are like two yes, more question so uh, right. uh, sharashot uh, sen sharma you can ask directly again uh, uh sir uh, my, my I'm, i'm sorry not sir but uh, my question is uh, what is the uh, sort of biggest problem in biggest hurdle in biophysics like uh, the experiments are very difficult to do Uh, the modeling is very difficult to do the computing power is very large which is the uh, all three i mean the any others i mean any others is like so because so imagine uh, how why it's hard so physics the contemporary physics started with newton okay he gave you the laws of pla planetary then kepler came he gave you the laws of pa planetary motion and everything so how did people do that because people had data the way they had data because leonardo da vinci uh, or galileo sorry invented the telescope and he could measure 
the trajectory of these planets. So any scientific field advances when you have the data and you have people who understand that data. And to understand that data, you need mathematics. So now you come back to contemporary science in the 2000s when Einstein and Niels Bohr and all those people. So at that point of time, people were worrying about what is the structure of atom and all those kind of things. So people developed quantum mechanics and all this stuff. So a lot of physics went into understanding these objects, which are passive objects. They do not have a meaning of life in them. Only recently, when scientists were not able to understand as to what is biology, like because biology is comprised of atoms and electrons and everything. But bio, the life is very different from inanimate objects. Why is that difference? No one can understand it and still no one can understand it. So there is a very huge gap in between the data and the understanding. So that's why you have so many diseases as well. You have cancer, you have, because no one understands it. When you understand it, you can solve it, but there's a problem. And, peop and people who understand it, I want to expose you to these kind of problems because you have to understand that it's important to solve real problems, not just some mathematical, no one cares about that in life. Uh, Shornadeep Nath, uh, you have one question you can kind of directly ask. And also, I want to tell you guys that study everything properly, English, study your mathematics, study your uh, computer science, everything, physics, chemistry, everything is important. Everything is related. So when you are young, you should study all of these kind of things because when you get old and if you want to do science, it will help you to think, oh, I was doing this when I was a kid, but I was, was not able to understand. When you grow old, you will be able to appreciate those things in life. And you would think, oh, my teachers were not stupid. So, so just, I just want to add, like some people think mathematics and language, like uh, uh, English or Bengali is totally different. But for me, both are the languages. So you are kind of expressing, you should be, uh, oh, so what happens, some people, science people just kind of ignore the, this language part, which kind of impedes them in expressing. If you can't express your thoughts, that is in your head, correct? So over time, it matters. So as what Shumit said, try to un like uh, learn every subject carefully and try to find the underlying reasons. So, so it kind of becomes very enjoyable and you can retain those, the essence of it. So always try to understand the problem in terms of the cause and effect. It might be difficult, okay? Just look at the effect and try to figure out the cause. And how you figure out the cause is because of your, because of your knowledge. Because you, in, your go, in your mind, you go back and see, oh, what is the force that is being exerted? Is it gravitational? Is it electrostatic? Is it something else? Something else. So that's how you think. So try to study and try to, do, try to make yourself proud and try to understand your life as much as you can. So. Uh, Shornadip, you have one question you can directly ask. Uh, how does the memory stored in the brain? I don't know, man. It's a very really hard problem. No one knows it. Sorry. Yeah. So th that is a that is a nobody understands properly. So you can kind of uh, think. So there are uh, maybe like what a, a few ideas, but still, we 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 really understand brain very very less. Uh, like we have like I would say like one person understanding of it. Shumit can kind of shed light more on that. So people are trying to understand that uh, very So carefully. the best possible understanding of memory is like through the recent advances in machine learning and everything. That's the most, uh, most uh, contemporary way of understanding how brain works. So imagine your brain is comprised of small nodes and it's kind of a neuron, okay? So the neuron goes from one, one neuron to the signal goes from one neuron. So whenever a visual image is shown to you, Imagine you have multiple neurons in your brain. So that signal goes on to one from one neuron to the other. And then at the end of it, you understand the meaning of that image. Okay. And that image, that structure of the neuron, the connectivity of the neuron is somehow stored in your brain. So whenever you see something like that, your brain tells you, oh, this is something. So that's how people understand it now. But it's a very uh, simplistic way of thinking. And I think it's, we, there's a lot more to understand there. And I might be, saying something wrong if uh, uh, if I don't know about it. But it's a very hard question to answer though. 
Yeah, so, so so when uh, we are kind of child, like we, we, we are taught like most of the things that discover are invented. I would say like, uh, like as Sumit is saying, you see, like we don't understand most of the stuff very carefully. So we are kind of looking uh, for people like you uh, kind of work on this uh, and we are trying our best, but uh, people like you and uh, put your heads into it and uh, we'll kind of learning more and more over time. So Mandir has one question. Mandir, you can, uh, if you don't mind, you can ask directly to Shumit. So background noise, uh, Shumit, you can kind of uh, read out the so, question. So the and... question is, uh, I was thinking that the basis of our discoveries is light, which we can see actually. Can there be something like photons which may belong to a different dimension? which we can actually follow the trajectory to get the other phenomena. Like, I mean, so now you're basically in your fancy, you're, so basically you're not talking about reality, you're in your fancy world cooking up a theory that there, is there something in some dimension or something like that? Now I cannot say whether it's true or right or wrong because I don't have any, it might be right, it might be wrong. So there's no way of answering this question. So if you give me something real, then I can say something about it. Yeah, yeah, you can ask me anything you want. Yeah, yeah, ask anything, like whatever you are feeling. Uh, you so can also ask me uh, if you're or not. I mean, uh, is there any uh, point in doing anything? So you can ask any of those kind of questions. As well. So I'll only give yes. you my understanding. Uh, I was actually thinking that uh, as far as I know, like mathematics is a kind of language for conveying different kind of concepts and uh, mutual relations between them. And maybe it can be same as uh, some other sorts of language that we uh, daily use on daily purpose like our bengali english but uh, in some cases we fail to convey our emotions by that language we have to resort to other medium of expressions so is there any limitation of mathematics in that sense i mean yeah mathematics i mean first of all the problem of emotions and all those kind of things are hard to quantify okay so you can only explain something when you know what you're trying to explain. And when you want to explain something in scientific terms, it has to be objective. You have to some data that you want to understand. And why is that data interesting? And why is the current knowledge not able to understand that data? So it's something like that. So you have to come up with that problem. I understand what you're trying to tell me that emotions and all those kinds, of, but emotions and everything on a level of science are just a bunch of chemicals which are interacting with each other. But the emergent property of those bunch of chemicals interacting is somehow that gives you a phenomenon of feeling or emotion or something like that. And it's very hard to come up with a understanding as to how do you go from objectivity to an emergent property which gives you something like emotions. And I don't know how to do it. If you guys, you might be smart enough, but I'm not that smart enough. No. So Ohaili has another question. Ohaili, you can ask directly. So, uh, the, how much progress has been ma made in cancer research? As as, uh, okay, so there is a lot of progress in cancer and everything. So, but the problem is, uh, you, the problem about cancer, you want to find a cure to, for cancer, okay? You, no one cares about uh, whether there is a mathematical theory or not, or no one cares. Those, those are philosophy. But the practical use is, can you, cure, can you find a cure for it? But finding the cure for it is very hard because you have your DNA, which is changing as a function of time and a small change in your DNA can make huge problems. So it's a very, it's like a chaotic system. Like I think you guys have heard about the butterfly effect. Like if there is a flicker in Amazon, there might be a tornado somewhere else. So it's something like that. A small change somewhere can create havoc somewhere else. So it's a very difficult system to work with. So that's why the progress, even though there's a lot of progress, finding the cure for it, it might be very hard. And there are many limitations and only when you work will you be able to understand that it's very hard, so. So basically I wanna tell you that science is a way to live your life. It, not, it might not be giving you tons and tons of money, but it will help you to understand what it means 
to live or what is the meaning or something. So it's the best way to live your, if you want to understand meaning to your life. But it's not useful if you want to make money. You should do MBA or something like that. Shonradeep, do you have one question you can directly ask or I can read out? Uh, sir, uh, in future, can we control our brain through some mechanical process or chips? Uh, yeah, I think like... people already do that. You can actually control your... Because, because basically brain is some kind of a signal, like some signal, and uh, basically an electromagnetic signal. So you can tune that signal through some external magnetic fields or something like that. And then you can do something with it. So you can always do those, but you have to define what you want to do. So you can always do something, but what you want to do, that might be hard to do. Okay. Uh, always think in terms of objective. So when you say brain, so the brain has made up of neurons and these neurons are basically sending electrical signals. And when you talk about electrical signals, there's a lot of physics on electromagnetics and everyone you can do a lot of it electromagnetism. So think like that. And, uh, then uh, now we can uh, we can perform any uh, any work for the brain uh, and its signal. But uh, can we control the, our brain? Can we control our brain? Like control when you say, okay, you want to do something or you want to do something. It's, I think it's a very hard problem. You have to change the DNA or something like that. So there are some technologies like CRISPR or something which can okay. edit the gene. And depending on what you want to do, you can do it. Um, okay, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Shokni, uh, you can ask or otherwise uh, you can read out from the question. Okay, uh, you can read out, yeah. First gulf from the glass of natural sciences will turn you into an atheist. But at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. What does the statement by Heisenberg actually mean? Okay, so, so everyone, when you think of these, uh, the world is a mess, okay? You have so many things. There's no possible way of understanding it and everyone, prescribes that there must be a God which is trying to understand these kind of stuff, which is trying to control this because no human being, at least till now, we have not been able to do it. So you think there is a God, but when you do science, it's so objective in nature that you don't prescribe that there can be a God or something like that. But when you do science and it seems miraculous to you that you can understand these processes through simple terms. Therefore, when you do, when you are exposed to science for a long, long time, like for 20, 30 years, at the end of the day, you would think, you would think, as Heisenberg has said, at the bottom of the glass is the God waiting for you because you have basically understood as to what is the best possible way to create a system which looks so complicated like the world around us. So that's why if you do science or engineering or maths, you will maybe possible to understand. Maybe you will understand what God is. Uh, Orunthuti, you can, if you want to ask directly, you can ask or otherwise you can read out. Okay, you can read the question, I guess. Yeah. Motion of ant in ground, motion of bird in air, motion of microbes. What is the similarity, unsimilarity? Okay, so when you talk about motion, you should think about Newton's law. Everything in life is Newton's law. Everything. If I didn't, if I, if you want to understand the world, you have to think in terms of Newton's law, some kind of a updating scheme of time. So, and Newton's law is an update, it's basically cause and effect. So the motion of and the motion of the bird, motion of the microbes are all related to that perspective that there is an underlying, underlying Newton's law there. But the manifestation of the dynamics that you will observe will be different because the interactions are gonna be different. So the motion of the bird, if you have multiple birds, they might look different. The motion of the ant might look different. The motion of the microbes might look different, but they must be through some kind of an underlying theme. And that underlying theme if you're, is, your, is your Newton's law. So another question is, uh, can you tell anything about quantum biology? Okay, quantum biology. So, I mean, it's a fancy term, but the simple thing is quantum mechanics talks about uh, 
it talks about the probabil probabilistic description of science. Like Newton's law is, is tells you that it's a deterministic picture, but quantum mechanics is like a probabilistic nature. So when you talk about, when you go to a scale of hydrogen atom, like when you have talking about DNA, quantum mechanics comes in because the hydrogen atoms can flip from one side to the other and the DNA might change. So that's quantum bi biology for you. So it's nothing, it's nothing very, it's a very fascinating name, but it's nothing very, something like that. It's not many, it's not a, some kind of a miraculous thing. So you should think of, uh, in, it, so you should look about, think about the data as to what, and within the realms of quantum mechanics, if you can explain that data, then that becomes quantum biology or something. Like that. There is another question he kind of mistakenly directed to me, but uh, the question is general. Uh, so uh, he says that he listens, everyone says life is full of mathematics. You are also talking about that. So that's, is it true or can you comment on that? Life is not full of mathematics. Your life is full of observations around you. You have your mother, you have your father, you have your stars, you have your moon. If you want to understand it, now you can ask me a question. Why do I want, why should I care? And you are within your rights to tell me, I don't care a damn about this thing. And you are perfectly right. You should not care. But if you care, and if you want to understand it, you have to describe in terms of data. And then to describe that data, you have to use maths. That's how scientific process works. You cannot explain that data in terms of Marathi, Hindi, Urdu, whatever. That's, that's it. Mathematics is to understand. If anyone has any more question, you can uh, directly ask, uh, or I would kind of wrap up with one question. So just let us wait for a few seconds. Um, you can ask or type it, whatever you like. Uh, I'm uh, Saraswata Shinchama. I had another question that, uh, uh, can I ask? You can ask. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, when we are building a model in science, uh, is it important, uh, are the mechanisms of the model important? Or is only the predictions or, or the confirmable the things important? Or are, are the mathematical constructs also, I mean, important it's important because imagine i can always cook up a linear equation so i since i have to i have to explain a data okay i can always cook up a mathematical function which gives me that data understand but that mathematical function is just a fit to that data it does not tell you anything more deeper but when you begin with a model which has a mechanism in it like the gravitational force or the electrostatic force, it tells you as to why, because the because, because when you have gravity, it tells you be it's because of the pull of the earth and the, that objects. When you have the electrostatics, it's because of the attraction or the repulsion between the charged objects. And when you have the strong and the nuclear force, it's because of the nucleus. It's because of the protons and the neutrons which are packed together in your, in your nucleus. So when you attribute and everything in life is made up of those kind of things. And when you attribute your model to those kind of forces, you have an understanding. And then you can build up on that mathematical model or understanding and predict something. Prediction is very important. Okay, thank you so much. But uh, uh, another question was, let's say we have uh, two models for the same phenomena, yeah. model A and model B. They are completely different, but uh, they give the same results. The predictions are the same. Everything is the same, but the mechanisms in both of them are different. Yeah. And uh, the mechanisms are such that we can't uh, measure them directly. Yeah. Then which one do we take? Or uh, is there any objective way to take any one of them? I'm going to comment something about you. The question that you have, I don't know whether you have read this, you have looked this question on somewhere, but if you have thought of this question independently, your intelligence is of the order of Feynman, by the way, because Feynman asked the same question. 
if you have asked this question independently, I'm very pleasantly surprised that you can ask this question because when I was your age, I didn't know about these things. So the way you do it is that imagine if you have a model A and a model B and they predict the same and they explain the same data. Now, how do you choose the model? There's no way to do it. The way you do it and the way science will progress is like you will predict something through that model and there will be future experiments which can measure that prediction. So then your model is being tested to some prediction and therefore the model that survives will be, will be uh, a more universal model like the theory of relativity or the Newton's law or something like that. Okay, Understand? so for present, we'll just accept both the models and yeah. we'll see later. Right. Yeah, because for everything that you uh, listen, like for Newton, uh, so as you grow further and further, there will be like for string theory, there is loop quantum gravity and everything. There are always two different ideas, but you need data to support which is a better idea and which is not a better idea. And uh, sir, uh, one more thing is that I have heard this. I don't actually know how Maxwell did it, but uh, I've heard that uh, when Maxwell derived those four equations, Yes. He actually came up with a, with a lot of theoretical constructs. But yeah, uh, I, mean, I mean, when you derive an equation, you need mathematics. And to do those kind of things, you need to have a fu fundamental training in mathematics. And you need to derive a lot of vector calculus and all this kind of thing to do those kind of stuff. Because Maxwell equations are based on uh, vector calculus. So you have to think about those kind of things. No, no, I mean, sir. Uh, uh, no, no. I, my question was that... Uh, uh, I, I've heard that Maxwell sort of came up with some uh, elasticity of ether or all those things, which, uh, but at present time, we still use the Maxwell's equations, but yeah. we don't refer to the elasticity of ether and all yeah, those the different things. In the context that you... of uh, the speed of light. Okay. So at those point of times, people thought that there is some kind of an uh, underlying field around us, which is people call ether, but the Michelson experiment ruled out that ether property. So no one now cares about ether. There's no ether in this world. Yeah, to kind of add to that, what happens like sometimes you create a model or mathematical tool that kind of goes beyond uh, the phenomena you are explaining, correct? People use that tool for some other scenario. For example, you will learn about kind of Fourier transform over time. Uh, so that some algebraic tool that was used for totally something else. So, okay, so I'll just go to another question. You can, uh, I can, uh, you can read it like Arundhati and Shubhradeep's Thank question. You, yeah. Can we ever cause a neuron to divide or any other can, I think you can do anything you want. I mean, I don't know whether it's possible, but there's the possibility. I mean, anything is possible, but the current tools might not be there, but because of CRISPR or something like that, there might be, you might be able to do it. I don't know. Oh, so Arundhati has a question like, does uh, Newton's law work for small molecular range in cells? And uh, how can you use that to explain this motion? You can explain it through, Newton's law is just a cause and effect. So depending on what's the resolution of your experiment and what's the data, you can come up with a mathematical function, a mathematical equation or differential equation to solve that trajectory as a function of time. It might be difficult, but you should be able to do it. So if anyone has any more question, we'll wait for a few seconds. Uh, then otherwise uh, I can wrap up. So just to say today, it was a very interesting talk and more interesting with the questions I at least find is very interesting. And like the whole purpose of this is basically, basically these questions and these interactions. Like if any one of you kind of get excited uh, about doing science or like just being curious about life, correct? You don't need to do science or be scientist or do this, but you, you whatever you do, uh, just be curious and like look at stuff and uh, why this is happening, why not, why this way, why not that way, uh, then, then kind of you will find uh, different answers and like you will like, uh, as I say, like Sharashot's question, correct? So, uh, so if he can, like, so then, like, you see, you can come up with something of the Richard Feynman's what they have thought. So basically, you are limited by your imagination, correct? So wherever the, you are, correct? Just don't stop this. 
uh, thing. Uh, what happens like over time, you get used to uh, your daily routine, but still, I think if you be, be curious, it will be very interesting stuff. So also just, just one thing I uh, also, uh, if Shumit want to add uh, anything, uh, I will go to Shumit. But the, the fundamental thing you talk about is cause and effect, correct? Just a kind of philosophical thing. So like, uh, so how do you know that fundamental construct is correct itself, correct? So why we are kind of looking at this cause and effect uh, lens. So uh, like, is this the one we can do currently? So cause and effect means there is an arrow, no, correct? There's a one arrow. So that can be like one line or two arrow or there'll be something else. So how do you know that fundamental I mean, model? There, is, can be, there can, I mean, your question is right, but there's no, I mean, I, I'm not in a position to answer this question because um, it, for me, I have this uh, assumption that something can only happen because something did that. So it's in my mind. It's in, ingrained in my mind. But there might, you are right that there might be some other things as well. So, so because in machine learning, we're kind of struggling with this causality, correct? So, so for example, uh, if uh, the systems might be causal, correct? So is not correlation and causality where this kind of line breaks and is it just anecdotes or so, so also this kind of vaccine, correct? This thing comes up, correct? Is it an anecdote? Is it a correlation or is it a causation, correct? So there no, is- a, no, 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 there is a, there is a cause, but to figure out the cause is very hard because imagine you are creating a machine learning algorithm or something like that, or a vaccine or something. So you are probing the object at a scale of micron, but everything is made up of atoms. So there is, and which is of, and the size of the atom is of the order of femtometers or something. So when you, there is a transformation of like orders of magnitude of nine orders of magnitude. When you do something like that, when you want to understand something at some scale, but the physics is mediated by some scale at very small scales, what the emergent property is gonna be is very hard to describe. So the effect is very simple. It's you have a vaccine, but the cause is a complicated cause. And there's a level to which you can understand it. And the pro and the more you probe and probe and probe, you will understand something else. So that's how I understand things. Yes. And, and the problem is even if you have some cause, you don't know that's the correct cause yeah. or correct there's thing to look at. Correct? One problem. Yeah. So like people thought about ether, correct? Then explain all the stuff, then the ether thing went, went away. Uh, like the smart people like Maxwell also thought something totally different who just did not exist. So uh, I kind of, if there is any more question, just kind of ask, or I will kind of give the last word to Shumit. I just of... want to tell one last thing to students. Like, yeah. Like, can I ask a question? Yeah, hey. yeah, you can ask a question. Uh, uh, I have read in books that uh, minus 273 degrees centigrade temperature yeah. is, the, uh, is the lowest temperature in the world. Yeah. Uh, uh, in that temperature, the gas has no volume or no pressure. But uh, there yeah, is in the book that uh, we, uh, uh, but in, uh, in the uh, in the books we have also read that uh, the uh, minus two seventy three de uh, degree centigrade uh, uh, before minus two seventy three degree centigrade uh, the gases are not uh, the gases are not uh, that which we are uh, trying to get uh, so. Why, my question is that why we use uh, that concept of minus 273 degree centigrade for further uh, for getting further equations or concepts on gases so first of all uh, your gas is made up of small molecules okay and the concept of temperature is basically a measure of how much there is motion so higher the temperature higher the motion so when you go to minus 273 degrees Celsius, the motion of, of the atoms, it's not provable. There is no experiment which has shown this, by the way. So it's a construct that the motion becomes so small, it becomes almost zero and the entropy of the system goes to zero. Because entropy, which is a measure of disorder in the system, and it, it can only be caused because of the motion and the entropy goes to zero and no, and people assume that the perfect crystals, the entropy is zero or something like that. So, so these are all the contemporary research problems and your books, I don't know what they write, but 
minus two times 73, they're just a reference to say that the zero Kelvin is there. It's like a calibration meter, something. So it's not like a nature's uh, something. It's like a, you're measuring through that scale. So you constructed a scale to measure the something. Um, so there is uh, one question like directly. Uh, he wants me to ask you this thing. So uh, <laughs> he's saying like, uh, just tell me uh, like you are up like beginnings, uh, like how your family contributed and how like, uh, so this line he's putting, uh, no matter from where you hail from our dreams are valid. So I think this is one of the fundamental things I also wanted to convey through this. So you can talk more about that then like people will be get further inspired. Yeah. So I think uh, I'm going to be very, um, so I think there is a scientific question here. I'm going to address that question at the last. So why did it take so long to get a coronavirus vaccine? Why do scientists do, why, what do scientists do while making these such vaccines? So I don't think the coronavirus vaccine took so long. It's just like eight or nine months. And to do something like this in eight or nine months is not very easy because imagine you first have to do the research and that research has to go through the FDA approval. FDA approval is a regulating authority which says whether that drug is right or wrong. So you have to go through phase one trials, phase two trials, phase three trials, phase four trials, and it has to go on human beings. So it takes time and it has, everything has been done within nine months and it's a very big achievement. And by the way, the coronavirus virus is not that difficult, by the way, I mean, to solve. It might be a big problem, but the, but the mechanism is not that hard. So, so therefore- the I just give you through your number, uh, the Moderna vaccine, we just got approved. The vaccine uh, after the genome structure got uh, uh, leaked, I would say, from a Chinese scientist, they created within two days. So, but after, even after creating two days, uh, it took that much time because we, as what uh, Shumit was saying, we don't understand our body. We don't understand our immunity system. So there is no simulation model, which just you can run. So maybe 50 years down the line, we will have more model, but currently we have to go through humans and these trials and get this, all this approved. And that's why it kind of took time. I think previous base to us like around 16 months or something. So this like, this is like unheard of, like, like, kind of doing this and doing the vaccine, understanding the genome, eight or nine months, like this is like a huge achievement, correct? So uh, I think you will understand the enormity of achievement over time. But uh, for me, this is like unheard of. I, I could not have guessed this would be that fast. So, okay. so you, you, you answered that question I asked you, correct? So that about your background and how you're up. Yeah, I'm going to answer yeah. this question. Yeah. I'm going to tell you the, everything very correctly and what happened in my life. So when I was a kid, uh, I didn't want to study anything. I mean, when I was, when I was a kid, like three years or something, uh, th like when I was standard three or something, then my, and my brother was very smart. Okay. He used to get high scores in schools and everything. And I, my father used to get impressed by him and he used to think I'm a, buff, I'm a buffoon or something like that. So I started studying as well to cope up with my brother. And I had huge amount of pressure in school because my brother was so good. But during the course of that time, I somehow become good in science, in science and math subjects. And, and uh, it's not like I was very deeply interested or something. I didn't have a background of science in my family or anything like that. My father is a normal uh, insurance manager or something like that and something. So it's not like my, science, my f family had a background or something. So it's all a matter of luck. And then I went through this, uh, when I was in 11th and 12th, I was preparing for my IITJ exam. And you know that when you prepare for that exam, you have to be very, very strong in everything, math, science, physics, and all this kind of stuff. So I took the KBPY exam and I somehow got through it. It was all luck. And I went to IISC Indian Institute of Science and there were many scientists who were talking about the way to live a life is through science or something. And I thought, oh, I looked at the buildings in ISC and I thought it's a very nice and cozy life. Or you don't have to do anything. You just sit down and don't do anything. That's how I thought at that point of time. So I was like, okay, I should do this. And then I took the IITJ exam and 
I, I, my exam did not go well. I, I, I might not have taken physics in IIT Kanpur, but I somehow got physics. I initially got in IIT Guwahati, but I somehow got in IIT Kanpur through physics. My, I put physics higher than the BTEC subjects in IIT Guwahati. And then when I was in IIT Kanpur, the physics department there is very strong, okay? So, and they taught me as to how people have thought about this world. Like you have Newton, you have Einstein, you have Schrodinger, you have all those people. And those are normal people. They are not extraordinary human beings. I mean, their, their achievements are extraordinary, but they were like us only. So I thought, okay, let's try to do this. And then I started doing my research. And I, so the way to do research is to do these kind of problems. Like you can go to ICERs, NICERs, and IITs and all this kind of stuff and take these courses and do research and try to understand what you want to understand. That's it. I mean, and then you do your PhD. And, and let me tell you, it's going to be very hard. It's not going to be easy. Because to figure out what you know and what is interesting, it's very hard. So only when you grow up, it's going to become easy for you. It's very hard. I mean, it's not easy at all, though. But if you have your family, which is requiring money and all this kind, I would suggest you should not do this because the money is a bit less in these fields. And like, you should do something more, which is important to your family. Like, uh, you should get a job, which is very, uh, which pays you a huge amount of money. And then you should do those kind of stuff. Yeah. But also what Shumit said, like try to find meaning, whatever you do, meaning and purpose, and that kind of makes things interesting. So Arundhati has another question. You can kind of uh, read that out. Some animals can feel the occurrence of natural disaster much more. Okay. So whenever a disaster or natural occurrence is happening, it's the, the propagation through the rocks is through waves. You have sound waves coming through the sound waves are propagating because of the fracture of the rocks. And that sound wave is propagated through a frequency in frequency. And the animals have the frequency detectors in their, in their brains or something, which can detect to higher frequencies. Our, our frequency is just from 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz, but animals have the frequency range, which is bigger than that. Therefore they can get the signals, which are much more quicker or something. They have a broad range of detectors, which can detect those sounds. Therefore they can detect it quicker. Okay, so I guess there is not any more questions. So you can kind of wrap it up and uh, like we can end the session. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. It was nice to talk to you. And if I can inspire even inspire even one of you to understand how this works, my job is done. And I would like to thank Swadhin for asking me to do this. And it's a very nice initiative by him. And he's a very creative human being and he does lots of things which I cannot even understand. So I can only do science or use, do useless things. So he is far more brilliant than I am, but it's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Very just, yeah. Okay. So I guess, uh, thank you for all the appreciation, but I am very, uh, uh, so I, I try to do stuff. Uh, so, uh,